In the Shadow of the Valley by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 9 Martin woke up in a warm bed with clean blankets for the first time in days. It was then he realized how much of a bath he needed. Climbing out of the bed, Martin felt incredibly well rested. He ambled out the door and stopped a monk. Is there a wash basin? The monk pointed to a stone archway off to the right, but did not speak. Martin walked through and discovered several wash basins. A couple of red pandas could be seen combing limbs with pick brushes. Martin grabbed a bucket and took it to the well that sat in the middle of the room, lowering it down into the cold water. He drew a few buckets, dumping them into the empty basin, taking a final bucket and hanging it over a fire. He sat and waited until bubbles rose in the water. Using a pair of tongs, Martin warmed the bath before shedding his clothes and climbing inside. Martin was slightly embarrassed as he began to comb the dirt and grime from his fur. Not from the public setting of the bath, but from the gray strands of fur that were beginning to show on his chest. He had been lucky. While most of his friends his age showed gray on their faces, Martin did not. Although his half-tail showed plenty of gray around the wound, the only other gray fur he had was not visible to the casual observer. He did not want to appear old, especially not to Miri. It would have been a stark reminder of the short time they had left. Martin shook such thoughts from his head, concentrating on grooming himself. Noticing glances from the curious red pandas, who had probably never seen a wolf before, Martin sunk low in the basin. It must have been someone's chore to pick up dirty clothes, for when Martin climbed out of the bath, he noticed a clean robe waiting for him. It was a welcome change from his traveling attire, which would have caused any nose in the vicinity to curl up at a single whiff. Feeling refreshed and wearing a soft robe, Martin wandered around the fort, eventually exiting the main building. Although sentries were posted around the walls, and archers practiced on dummies in the main courtyard, the place seemed peaceful. Couples strolled along together with admittedly grim expressions on their faces. Children played without a care in the winter flower beds, and old withered ones sat taking breakfast by the frozen pond. Martin spotted Arbalist with the elders. Deciding he needed to get to the bottom of this whole thing and not chat with the elderly, Martin stopped another passing monk. Where can I find Lynn? The monk smiled. I'll show you. Martin and the monk walked briskly through the snow and back into the main building. Martin looked at the many wall drapes, then back at the monk. Why do the felines attack you? You seem peaceful enough. We have a large stockpile of food, which is why they're trying to accelerate the siege. Other than that, it's our practice. Martin looked at him with suspicion. Your practices? They seek pride from defeating those who they think are inferior. In their eyes, because of something we do, we are inferior. Oh, I know that. I meant specifically. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's our peaceful ways, or... A door opened right beside them, and Niv burst out. Martin, there you are. I was looking everywhere for you. The monk shuffled awkwardly. I was taking him to Lynn. Niv nodded and grabbed Martin's arm. I'll take it from here. Niv pulled Martin down the corridor with a backwards glance at the monk. He didn't say anything weird, did he? No, not really. He was just explaining why the felines are attacking you. Niv laughed. Okay, well, Linda's waiting for you. Come, he's taking breakfast right now. We can join him. Practically as she was finishing her sentence, she pushed open a door, revealing a well-adorned room. Lynn sat at a table in front of a wide spread of food, the sight of which sent Martin's mouth into a fit of tingles. Lynn looked over and smiled. There you two are. Come, sit. Martin and Niv sat, Niv scooting close to Lynn and Martin taking a position opposite to them. The table was small and circular, but it held plenty of food for all of them. Martin picked up a bowl and filled it with a creamy fish broth adding a very crusty and fluffy loaf to his plate. After a brief period of food demolition, Lynn addressed Martin. You must have many questions. I don't know if I can, but I will try to answer all of them. <laughs> You're a seer. 
Can't you predict whether or not you can answer the questions? Lin looked at him blankly for a moment, then burst out laughing. <laughs> it's not that simple, my friend. I cannot choose what I see, only when I see. Martin nodded dumbly. So, how did you know who I was? Lin's face screwed up a little at the relatively simple question, and he tapped his claw against his teeth. Well, that is a difficult one. The answer may not be the one that will answer your question. Try me. Very well. I saw you. In a book. A book? What book? I don't know what it was called. I saw the book in a vision. A vision, huh? Is that how you see the future? Niv watched the conversation play out with as much interest as Martin. Yes, it is. Strange, really. I just have them sometimes. If I concentrate, I can induce them. Given everything Martin had heard thus far, he was still skeptical. That sounds interesting. Could you demonstrate this? Lin and Niv both got looks on their faces. What? What is it? These are not... pleasant visions. Some of the images can be horrible, and the experience itself is very painful. I see. Lin looked at Martin, slightly apprehensive. That being said, I wanted to show you one. What? I discovered a way to... share visions with people. He looked at Niv, who was still worried, but also slightly self-conscious. I figured out how to do it through an... experience I had with Niv. It was similar. Martin put down his bowl and waved his paws. Wait, wait, wait. You brought me here to do some painful ritual to see the future? You know what that sounds like to me, right? As a matter of fact, I do. It sounds insane. Martin nodded. Look, what's the harm in humoring me? It's simple, really. I grab your head, you grab mine, and I initiate a vision. Martin cocked his head to one side, perplexed but intrigued. This is very much like a comedy I once read. Niv chided him. This is serious, Martin. I must show you a great many things. It is vital. Martin held up his paws and relented. All right. I'll do as you ask. Lin nodded, then stood. Come. We will be more comfortable in my study. Martin followed Lin to a door in the back of the room. He noticed that Niv stayed seated. You... aren't coming? No. Why not? Lin chuckled and led Martin into the room. Because the process takes a long time. Come, sit in this chair. Martin was ushered into a soft, overstuffed armchair. How long exactly? Lin sat across from him in a similar armchair, pulling it closer to Martin. I don't know exactly. It took me a full day once. Well, hurry up then. Lin nodded and took Martin's paws. He placed them under his ears. Hold on there. Lin's paws assumed the same position under Martin's ears, and he closed his eyes. Although the room was peaceful and relatively safe, Martin was suddenly afflicted by a strange feeling of foreboding. He gulped and waited for something to happen. Kethresh had risen very early, and after a cleansing bath, she set out to sate her hunger. Following the smell of cooking, she found a dining hall with an exceedingly long table. A few other early risers sat waiting for something to be ready. Among them was Bronze. Up early, aren't you? He said as she plopped down next to him. Yeah, well, I was hungry. Kethresh cast her gaze around the ornately decorated room, the faded ancient tapestries telling tales of old, and the stained glass windows casting crazy colors upon the floor and table. Interesting place, huh? Bronze nodded his agreement. I like old places like this. It makes me sad in a way. All that history that no one may ever learn of again. Yes, I know what you mean. Bronze stood and gestured for Kathresh to follow. Come, look at this. He led her to the back wall, where the oldest tapestry hung. Although only a few details remained from the rich history it depicted, it was clear the meticulous care that went into its creation. The tapestry framed a single figure, 
his stoic but kind face remaining undamaged by the elements, despite the disrepair the tapestry was in. Kethresh puzzled over it for a moment. That isn't a red panda. It looks like some sort of scavenger. Bronze nodded. Perhaps Arbalest would know what it means. It's quite exquisite, anyway. Things like this always show up. Bronze looked at her, puzzled. What do you mean by that? Um, nothing. Just musing. Kethresh smiled weakly, but Bronze wasn't convinced. Kethresh, I've been meaning to ask you something. Where did you get so skilled with the blade and the sling? Kethresh became nervous very quickly, but she forced herself to meet Bronze's gaze. That is none of your business. Bronze walked back to the table and took a seat well away from any of the fast breakers. He looked over at Kethresh, and she sighed and sat with him. He cleared his throat. Let me tell you where I'm from, then. Kethresh wasn't expecting that. He looked at her and grinned. But then, you have to answer my question. She narrowed her eyes. What if I don't want to hear your story? People are always more willing to hear other people's stories than they are to share their own. Also, people are more likely to tell you their story if you tell them yours. It's called trust. Kethresh looked away and scraped at the wooden tabletop with her claw. Well... Just listen. There is only a little to tell, but I will tell it. He stopped a moment to gather his thoughts, then began. My home is ravaged by the same war as yours. Felines expanding their empire into mustelid territory. Yes, I know. Yes, well, that's where I come in. I am no soldier, nor do I have any will to fight if I don't have to. I'm a farmer. I love peace. So when the felines burned down my farm, I came here in search of someone I knew from when I was a kid. A wise alchemist, Pill. That's it? Yep. Huh. So, you're looking for Pill to find peace? Yes, I suppose. He may know of a place free from war. Ironic, isn't it? I get tangled up in a war in my search for peace. <laughs> at least you once knew peace. Bronze raised an eyebrow and looked at Kathresh, who smiled sheepishly. I'm a soldier. Was a soldier. I committed a crime, and they sentenced me to hang, and I ran away. There, I told you. Bronze nodded. Thank you for sharing. What did you do, may I ask? I would prefer not to answer. How do I know you won't do it again? You were sentenced to hang. It must have been bad. <laughs> You're in no danger. Someone walked by with a large serving tray on wheels and dropped off some breakfast food. Bronze thanked them as they rolled by. Kethresh sighed and grabbed some bread, looking at the other foodstuffs. More fish? Is that all they have here? Bronze spewed crumbs as he spoke around a mouthful of crusty bread. The bread is good. He swallowed. So, what did you mean by the tapestry? About them always showing up? She chewed pensively on a bun. We recover a lot of art in raids. I served in the Flatland Attachment. It was clear that Bronze had no idea what that meant. It was a band of canine soldiers who were sent to clear the southern flatlands of felines. They had a lot of art with them. We were told to burn it all. A damn shame. Aye, that it is. Tezar fumed silently. She sat on a rock overlooking the construction of the tower. Picking up a rock from the ground, she studied it. It was full of holes and looked weathered and old. She clutched it in her fist. He had been right there. She made eye contact with him. He was an old, injured, and pathetic canine, and she missed him. A noise caused her to jump. Stonewall was standing in front of her, tapping his foot and grinning. I don't know about you, but one botched operation does not make me that angry. Tezar growled low in her throat but did not lash out at Stonewall. I am disappointed in myself. Is that a crime? <laughs> no, and nor should it be. You should feel disappointed because you screwed up. 
But we have work to do. Soon we can begin the assault. Construction is nearly finished. Tezar knew he was right. Moping would do nothing. How long? We will be ready by tonight. Tezar nodded, then paused. I took a look at your battle plan. It seems like it won't be a perfectly clean victory. Stonewall set his jaw in thought. True, though no battle is perfect. I predict our losses will be noticeable. A necessary sacrifice. I have a plan to lower them. Let me develop it a little. <laughs> I get the hint. I'll leave you to it. He wandered back to the unfinished tower, bored. Tezar unclenched her fist and let the dust that had once been the rock fall to the ground. She stood and headed in the opposite direction, towards the camp. Walking until she reached the supply tent, she ducked inside. She looked over the boxes and barrels, reading the scribbles on them. Eventually she found lamp oil, sitting in a gigantic barrel. She walked back to the tent flap and poked her head out, calling to the nearest soldier. Grab some others. I need help moving the lamp oil. The cat looked puzzled. Why, sir? Never you mind. Move it! She spotted Zick coming her way and sighed. He had already seen her, so there was no use in trying to hide from his chiding. As he walked up, Tezar held up her paws. I know. I failed in the ambush, but... Don't make excuses, Tezar. It was dark. I would have made the same mistakes. Maybe if it was you and your brothers commanding those groups, it would have turned out differently. This is true, but it wasn't so. But never mind that. What are you up to now? A faint smile played across Tezar's face. <laughs> A swift victory for us is what? Listen to this. Martin watched Lin's face, wondering if the whole thing was some elaborate prank. Just as his arms began to feel like wet pasta, something happened. Lin tensed up and began to fall forward. Martin wanted to break his grasp and stop him from falling, but he found his paws were as if they were fused to Lin's face. He could not move, his arms holding up Lin's body. Suddenly, his vision clouded, and he felt a dull pain begin to radiate through his head. It knocked him cold. Martin was in the sky, somehow. Strangely, however, the stars seemed to be the same distance they were when he was on the ground. Realizing how ridiculous it was that he was in the sky, Martin began to flail about in panic, expecting to fall to the ground. But, for some reason, he floated, unable to do anything but struggle uselessly. He looked down at the world, his heart leaping. He tried to scream, but the incredible pressure that surrounded him prevented him from making any noise. He ignored all this and focused on the world. It was strange. There were great patches of what looked like metal covering portions of the continents. This metal sparkled prettily and impossibly. He pondered all this for a moment, having no idea how he got there and not seeing anyone else around. His thoughts were cut short as a monster loomed in his vision. It was angular, made of glass and metal. It spewed fire and came right for him, a demon straight from his deepest nightmares. The instant he splatted against its artificial skin, he was inside. He saw a feline and a canine talking around a brilliantly luminescent table. He waved his arms. Why have you brought me here? They did not seem to acknowledge his presence. Instead, they continued talking. He was unable to make out exactly what they were saying. Although they sounded like Atrians, the words did not click in Martin's head. It was incredibly frustrating. He walked up to the canine and pushed his shoulder. Do you not see the feline? Martin simply passed through him, stumbling past the canine and through the wall, back into the void of space. He didn't stay there long, and with a wrenching sensation that would have emptied his stomach if he had one, he was back on Atria. He stood in the middle of a strange stone path. People walked to and fro, some on small mechanical vehicles that hummed as they passed. The noise was incredible. People laughed, music played, and strange horns sounded. Buildings rose into the sky on either side of the path, boxing him in. Martin instinctively dodged a vehicle as it buzzed past him, 
causing him to stumble through a wall and into a building. The atmosphere inside was energetic. People sang and laughed, drank and ate. He walked up to one of the patrons of this strange shop. Hello, can you hear me? Martin saw the man was feline, and he stumbled back in fright. He turned and was faced with a horrific image. A feline and a canine were leaning over a table, kissing in broad daylight. From birth, Martin was taught that this was wrong, so he ran from that place of sin. Why was no one doing anything about it? He ran to a rat who was playing a stringed instrument by the side of the path. Somebody! Help me! The rat did not see him. He moved towards a couple holding hands, a ferret and a fox. What are you doing? This is madness! They laughed as if at him. He ran down the path, hoping to find an escape. He rounded a corner and stopped dead. On the side of the path was a statue. It was about the size of a person, and most people passed it by without much thought. He stepped closer to look at the figure's face. It was a wolf. It was him. Suddenly his body shook. Someone was waking him. He shot up so fast his head slammed into Niv's. Oh! You're awake, finally. Martin looked around in deep confusion. Where was the stone path? The people? Where am I? You're in our monastery. Lynn was standing there too, looking concerned. It's almost night time, Martin. I awoke after our vision and you were still out cold. Martin began to recall who he was. I... I don't understand. What was all that? That was what is to come. Tezar stood in full combat gear with Ziff and Zip before the army that was assembled below them. The night had fallen, and the darkness prevailed. Stonewall stumbled through the night with Laol by his side. Everything is in place, sirs. We are ready to go. Zip looked at Ziff, who nodded. He crouched down and struck two sparking rocks together over a torch of cloth. Holding it aloft, he swung it back and forth, the signal to attack. A good chunk of the soldiers began to push the tower towards the fort. It was made much heavier by the barrel of lamp oil at its base. Archers moved in front, ready for their signal. Everything was in place. Zick stood on the tower, coordinating the army. All right, you lot. This is the real thing. Be careful with that oil. Don't let your sparking rocks even touch. The marching would soon be heard, and the red pandas would rise in defense of their home. The blood that was to be shed was almost palpable. Cole stood in his tent, his two aides strapping armor onto his chest. Rita entered, wearing a rapier on her belt. Cole smiled. That was quick. No problems, I hope. Rita shook her head. I keep my sword in good repair. It didn't need much sharpening. She gulped. Cole beckoned for her to step forward as his aides finished the application of his armor. I know you're scared, my child, but don't be. Unless the assault is a spectacular failure, you won't see a single hair of any feline. It's not me I'm worried about. It's you and Harimel and everyone else. The aides moved to his legs. We are trained warriors. Do not worry about us. We will live. Rita wasn't so sure. Famous last words. Cole stepped forward, armor clanking. Come, let's go. He led her outside, where all the commotion was taking place. Tents were disassembled, people ran around with packs and boxes, and many great laxar-drawn carts were loaded up. He led her past the supply convoy and towards the army. The main force of the canine army stood ready to depart for the final push through the feline's defensive line. After that, it was a straight shot on to the capital, where the feline's monarch was. Cole swung his ironclad arm in an arc. Each one of these men and women know what would happen if they fail. They will prevail! I know this! Rita nodded. He pulled her into a hug, though with his armor, it was less personal. We're leaving now. It will be some time before we see each other again. Watch yourself. Rita nodded, and Cole let go of her. I have faith! father. He turned around and strode towards the army. Rita sighed and walked back to the supply caravan, 
who wouldn't even come anywhere near the battle zone. Despite this, a few soldiers were delegated to protecting it. Rita jumped on the head cart. To her surprise, Harima was sitting there too. Hello, my lady. Harima? The general instructed me to keep you safe, in case the worst-case scenario occurs. I see. Overprotective, as usual. Despite the comment, she was touched by Cole's concern, however unnecessary it was.